limitless energy. How laser-driven fusion could power the planet. Tammy Ma, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. On November the 9th, 1989, I was too young to remember this significant event. Our modern world is incredibly reliant on energy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and as you can see from this satellite image of the Earth at night, where there are generally large populations of people, large cities, it's lit up brightly on this map, right? So Europe and the US, they show up quite bright. China and India, they're pretty bright too. But here's the thing, China and India should actually be a whole lot brighter given their population densities. So really, this becomes a map, not just of our energy usage, but of wealth and access to energy and standards of living worldwide. Now, imagine, imagine a world where we had limitless clean energy. All of a sudden, this map becomes significantly brighter all around the world. And with that, new possibilities and technologies to solve problems of today. For example, desalination. We've got the technology, we know how to do it. However, it's incredibly energy intensive, and we can't do a lot of it in places that need it. Carbon capture, again, another technology we know well, that we know how to do, but is energy intensive, so we only do it sparingly now. In a world of limitless clean energy, all of a sudden those standards, standards of living go up, but also with that, every nation on Earth now has energy security and energy sovereignty. Imagine that. Is it possible? Well, to make that happen, certainly we need to scale up our energies of today significantly. But really, is there another answer? Could we perhaps harness something like fusion, the reaction that powers the sun, and bank miniature stars here on Earth to harness that energy? So like I said, the sun and the stars are powered by fusion, and the idea behind fusion is actually quite simple. We're interested in taking deuterium and tritium. They are isotopes of hydrogen, heavy hydrogen. And if we slam them together by getting them hot and getting them dense, close enough that they fuse, we create a helium nucleus and a neutron and a huge amount of energy. So fusion occurs when light ions are joined together to make a heavier ion and energy is released. How does that work? Well, everybody, even young children, understand the equation e equals mc squared. If you weigh your deuterium and tritium, they weigh a certain amount before the reaction. After the fusion process, if you weigh the products on the other side, that neutron and helium nucleus, they weigh a little bit less. And that little bit of liberated mass goes into Einstein's equation as the m. We're gonna multiply by c, the speed of light, a huge number squared, and you get tremendous amounts of energy out. That is the potential of fusion. So fusion fuel is very powerful. One pound of fusion fuel is equivalent to the amount of energy you would have in 5,000 barrels of oil, which is equal to three and a half million pounds of coal. So imagine if this glass of water were deuterium tritium fuel, this would be enough to power Berlin for an entire day. So fusion energy is actually attractive for many reasons. First of all, it is inherently safe. As I go through this talk, you're gonna get a feel for how difficult fusion actually is. And that's because you have to drive the reaction with a decent amount of energy to get fusion going. So if you ever wanna stop a fusion reaction, you just cut off the initial energy source. It is different from fission, where you do have to worry about runaway. It is sustainable. We know how to obtain the fuel that we need without damaging the environment. In fact, one in every 10,000 particles of seawater is D2O instead of H2O. 
Now tritium, we do have to breed, but we know how to do that. Base load. It's envisioned that fusion power plants would be on the order of hundreds of megawatts to gigawatt scale, similar to coal-powered plants of today. And furthermore, fusion is incredibly flexible. You can place it geographically anywhere, and you can load follow. There's no geologic storage. There's no high-level nuclear waste associated with fusion. It is carbon-free and energy security. Because fusion could be so abundant, it means energy security for nations around the world. So like I said, fusion is what happens in the sun, right? But whereas the sun is a million miles across, and we can't really duplicate that scale here on Earth, what we're going to do is generate miniature stars on the order of two one-thousandths of an inch, about half the diameter of a human hair. And to do that, let me introduce you to the National Ignition Facility, the NIF, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in Northern California. We are about 80 kilometers east of San Francisco. NIF is the world's largest and most energetic laser, enabling the generation of those fusion conditions on Earth. And as you can see, it is the size of three American football fields side by side, 10 stories tall housing 192 separate laser beams. Each one alone is one of the most energetic in the world, and we're going to combine 192 of them to give us 2 megajoules of energy, 500 terawatts of power. What that means, it's actually a 1,000 times the power of the entire US electrical grid. But how come your lights don't flicker at home when we take a shot? It's because power is energy over unit time, right? So we take huge amounts of energy, compress it into just a few nanoseconds. And if I take the roof off of the building to give you a look inside, basically this enormous building is housing thousands, thousands of very complex optics. And we take those 192 laser beams, and we're going to concentrate all of that energy into a very small target. On the top right, is um, the Holram, a German word for empty room, a little canister that the lasers are going to shoot into. And then on the bottom left is that capsule that is two millimeters in diameter. And I know this is very difficult to conceptualize. We're going to play you a little video to show you how it all comes together. So this is the NIF control room. It is where I, as an experimental plasma physicist, do many of my experiments. I have spent many nights over at the NIF. So first, the lasers are going to be born in the master oscillator room. Here, the laser starts as a fiber laser at a nanojoule level, so about a thousand times less energy than a typical laser pointer. We're going to split the beam 48 ways, and it's going to go into the pre-amplifier, bouncing 60 to 100 times, getting amplified up to the millijoule level, so now about a laser pointer. We're going to split each beam another four ways, and it's going to make four passes back and forth across the enormous facility. Now, at this point, we're going to start to follow one of the laser beams, and each one is about this size, 40 by 40 centimeters. And the reason the laser has to be so big is because it contains so much energy. We actually have to spread that energy out over the optic as it's traveling through so as not to damage the optics themselves. And now we're going to follow the laser beams as they approach the target chamber. It's a vacuum, a spherical vacuum chamber, about 10 meters in diameter. You're going to see half the beams get sent upwards, half get sent downwards. And it looks like they're all traveling at their own speed, right? But at this point, you're going to see them all sync up. We're going to frequency convert and change the color of that laser light from infrared to green to UV, so blue UV light. And now it's incident on that tiny target that sits in the middle of the chamber. Half the laser beams come in through the top laser entrance hole, half through the bottom. They're irradiating the inside to generate a very energetic flux of x-rays, an x-ray oven, to start to compress that fuel capsule that sits right in the middle. So we're going to start blowing the shell off. And by compression, we're also going to start heating the DT fuel that sits in the middle. And if we do it right, we have more energy out than we put in. And indeed, 
For the first time, scientists have produced a nuclear fusion reaction that created more energy than was expended, a breakthrough to tap into the same kind of energy that powers the sun and the stars. Researchers at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California announced the details today, and it could have huge implications for potentially creating clean and limitless energy someday. So in an experiment last December, at the National Ignition Facility for the first time in human history, we generated more energy out of the target that was put in. And this is a goal that we've been working on for over 70 years. And that plot on the right shows you all of our deuterium tritium experiments over the past 12 years on the NIF, and you can see how much of a struggle it actually has been. Um, the y-axis is our fusion yield, year is on the x-axis, that pink line is the maximum laser energy available. The name of the game was always to get above that pink line, and finally last December we did it. Now, we've actually been able to repeat that a few times now, so it wasn't a fluke. And in July of this year, we repeated ignition with a yield of 3.88 megajoules for 2.05 megajoules of laser energy in. This is a gain of 1.9, so almost twice as much energy out as we put in with the lasers. Now, what does that really mean, though? What is ignition? Well, basically, Ignition establishes the basic scientific feasibility of fusion as a potential energy source. Now, I know everybody here has heard the joke, right? Fusion is 50 years away, always will be. Yeah, that's because it's really freaking hard. So what we've able, been able to demonstrate now is that fusion engine that we would need in the center of a, for example, power plant. And you can imagine, right, if we can generate more energy out than we put in, what you can do is start to run your power plant with that energy. And if it's a lot more energy out, you feed it out to the grid. Now, in order for fusion to be commercially viable, economically viable, in reality, we would need gains of about 50 to 100, 50 to 100 times more energy out than we put in. However, if you're saying, ah, oh, let's do a demonstration, and let's just generate enough energy to run the laser itself, you only need gains of 15 to 16. And I mentioned that we've already achieved gains of close to two. So it's not going to be easy, right? We still need a factor of eight for self-feedback. Um, you know, self However, you remember that histogram I just showed you. On the NIF, in the past 12 years, we've improved by over a factor of 1,000 already. So maybe we're getting close. But there's still many technological challenges. Some of them are shown here. Besides having very high gains of 50 to 100, you would have to shoot on the order of 10 hertz, 10 times a second. So you would need a target factory to produce low-cost targets rapidly. You would need a driver, such as lasers, to heat and compress that target to fusion ignition. You need a chamber with walls that can absorb those energetic neutrons, convert into heat, feed it into a steam plant that can turn into electricity. So there are many multitude of challenges that we do need to work on. I'm not going to say it's easy, but that's also what makes this so exciting. Because, remember, this vision, a future where energy could be limitless, it could be clean. And that completely changes our paradigm, our relationship with energy. No longer would energy be a strategic commodity that we fight wars over. Instead, it becomes a commodity that is just so common, like salt. Can you imagine that? Now, the breakthrough that we had on the NIF has been compared to the Wright brothers moment in 1903, where they demonstrated human flight for the first time, lifting off the Earth for a full 13 seconds. And what that did was open up an entire new era where it was just amazing. Human innovation, human ingenuity made it possible that in 1957, just 54 years after that first flight, Boeing released their 707, the first passenger commercial flight. 54 years, that's a fraction of a human lifetime. And that's what is possible 
with Fusion. So now that we've achieved ignition on the NIF, we are one step closer to harnessing the energy of the sun and the stars and breaking that wall to limitless energy. Thank you.